You're about to listen to Pastor Bidemi McMordy, the senior pastor of the Well Oasis International. May you be transformed by God's word. Join us daily at 5 a.m. for Commanding Your Morning as we prevail in prayers and position our day for triumph. To connect, follow Bidemi McMordy on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to the Bidemi McMordy YouTube channel or download the Bidemi McMordy app. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. We're still in this series, Foxes and Fixes. And um, this is the 11th installment of Foxes and Fixes. Hallelujah. So last week we looked at the, the arrow fox. We focused on the story of Adam and Eve. How um, the serpent said to Eve, did God say? And Eve said, oh, God didn't say we shouldn't. Um, God said we shouldn't even touch lest we die. And from a reproduction of a, a faulty reproduction of what God had said, a journey downward spiraled into major error that led into spiritual death. Hallelujah. That error led into spiritual death. And I did say that the thing about the error fox is that all of us are guilty of it by default. And um, even as we go, even after we get born again, the reason why we needed to become born again was because we were already dead spiritually in our sin. Hallelujah. And now that we have gotten born again, hopefully, what is happening is there are still some fundamental um, erroneous thinking or mindsets that we need to consistently cast down. Otherwise, we cannot get into the fullness of the stature of, of Christ in us. Hallelujah. We said last week that to fix the error fox, we should do what? We should worship. That is, and we said worship is not music, it's a surrender of our lives totally and completely so that Christ can be fully formed in us. So that I don't um, overflow the issue. Today we go into another fox. And just like the fox last week and the one before it, these things are real. And if you are listening and you are taking a look at your life, you will see that just because a man is born again does not mean that he has his life together. Praise Jesus. Remember that when we started, we looked at the difference between sanctification and consecration. Praise Jesus. That we are set apart and then we begin to do the work on a daily consistent basis to attain perfection. Praise Jesus. Now we did also say when we started, you know, many, many weeks ago, that um, just because a man is born again and he has something lying dormant in his life does not mean that the thing is dead. And so there are people who have had some perversive nature before they met with Christ. What happens is that the man becomes a new creature, but he needs to take the old out of him. Praise Jesus. And so I know we say we are crucified with Christ and buried with him, yes. But if you are not proactively and consistently interacting with the things of God, what is likely to happen is one day if the environment is conducive, the, the thing that has been dormant will rear its head. Praise Jesus. That's when you begin to hear people have conversations that say something like, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. It was lying there all the while. You just did not submit it. You didn't drag it to the full surface. You didn't submit it so that it can be taken care of. So it's been lying there for a long time. And today, what's happened is that the environment is right. The right people are there. Everything, the mood is right. Everything is right. So you fall flat on your face. And so once you know that something plagued you before you became a child of, or you became born again, part of your responsibility is to take that conscious thing, that take that thing consciously and submit it to God and say, Lord, I used to lie and I was really good at it, but I submit it. Whatever you don't submit will always have a hold over you. Praise Jesus. Part of what we talked about was we looked at the book of James and we looked at that the devil thrives in what? Secrecy. So whatever you are hiding because you don't want people to think, oh, man of God, woman of God, child of God, you are involved in this. Ultimately, that thing will fall you. It will have you flat on your face before you can say Jesus. And the reason why it will be very, um, very effective in having you flat on your face is because you were hiding it. And as long as you are hiding it, what it means is that you are in darkness. 
And as long as you are in darkness, what it means is that the devil can have a field day. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Last week, I didn't say this, but I want to say it. If you look at the scripture, how do we end this thing? It's to return to God, to rest in his word, to be quiet, not in making a point, and to be confident in what God has said. Every fox can be checked by this thing. It's a process, yeah? But there are specific processes for each fox. Praise Jesus. Today, as our 11th uh, installment, we want to move to another fox. So if you go with me to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Obviously, our character is Jonah because the entire book of Jonah is about the man Jonah. Praise Jesus. And incidentally, we are going to be looking at all four chapters of Jonah today. Praise the Lord. So if you go to the book of Jonah, if you open to chapter 1 from verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1. Verse 1 is where I read extensively, but I'll mention the verses because I'll skip some of them. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tashish. So he paid the fair thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind unto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. What I have read is verse 1 to 4. If we go to verse 7, it says, And they said everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which had made the sea and the dry land. If you skip and go with me to verse 11. Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may become unto us? For the sea was wrought and was tempestuous. Verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto you. For I know that for my offense, for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Praise Jesus. Verse 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her, from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord, feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus name. So, we all know the story of Jonah. If you went to Sunday school, even if you went to Sunday school for just six weeks, the story of Jonah is one story that is interesting, very interesting for young people. So it's told over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, I think that Sunday school teachers have a number of stories that they tell over and over and over and over and over. Hallelujah. So Jonah was a prophet of God because if you look at verse number one, it says, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord, and so the word of God came to him. Praise Jesus. God had something to say, so he looked for his prophet. Praise the Lord. And the word that God spoke was very simple. He said, go, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to underline it in your Bible, that God acknowledged that Nineveh was a great city. And cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. I want you to underline wickedness. Their wickedness, because God did accept and acknowledge that Nineveh was a wicked people. Praise Jesus. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's hilarious. Who runs from the presence of the Lord? 
For a prophet to be running from the presence of the Lord, he, there must be something wrong with him. But let's go on. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now there is so much I can begin to preach out of here, but I want to focus on today's fox. I don't want to do details, so I'm going to try very hard, as tempting as it is to begin to lay on Jonah on paying fares, to go down and all of that. I'll try not to do it. Hallelujah. So God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah bought a ticket for Tarshish. He refuses to go. But he doesn't say why. We just see him wake up the next morning and take off. He's running in the exact opposite direction of where God told him to go. So he bought a ticket and got in a sh- on a ship. Hallelujah. May someone who is suffering from a fox not get on your ship in Jesus name. Because Jonah got on this ship and the Lord was not going to have it. So the Lord sent a great wind against them. And they said the storms came and it was tempestuous. You know, if there are places we skipped. Because I said, may the Lord not allow someone running from a fox or harboring a fox. Get in your ship. You, You didn't say amen properly. Because you probably did not see what it cost them. Because Jonah was on their ship. Because Jonah got in their ship, when the wind became as boisterous as it was, they didn't know what to do. The valuables they had on the ship, they started to throw them overboard. They said, let's lighten the weight on this ship, otherwise it's going to break in two. So in a bit to save their lives, not out of anything they had done, they tried to cast their valuables into the sea. But something was very funny. They were casting their valuables into the sea. The person who caused the wahala had gone down. He bought extra tickets. So he went to like the first class. He went down, down, where he could sleep undisturbed. And so the Bible said they started, everybody, every man started to call unto their gods. They were screaming. They were calling to their gods. Then the captain was looking. Is there anybody not praying? At the bottom of the ship, he saw, he saw, and um, what's his name? Jonah. Jonah was asleep and he woke and said, what do you mean by sleeping? Praise Jesus. And he asked Jonah, he said, who are you, Seth? And Jonah said, verse 9, hilarious. And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, number one. And I fear the Lord, mm, number two. The God of heaven, which had made the sea and the dry land. Verse 10 said, the men were exceedingly afraid. What was it about what Jonah said that made the men afraid? Because it dawned of them, this kasala came because of somebody. It's the God of the Hebrews that is against us today. We are in big trouble. So they said to him, what will we do to you now? Because we, certainly it's not us. God is used to our level of sin, but you, you have extra. And he said to them, take me and cast me into the sea. He just told them that he served the God of the Hebrews, that is. Is Hebrew and he said the God of who made the dry land and the sea. And he, they are, he's asked them to throw him into the sea. These people don't want to offend the God of heaven anymore. So they actually didn't want to throw him. So instead they started to try to go really fast to see whether they could get to land. It wasn't working. So they got into prayer. And they started to, re- they said, God, we are going to have to toss him. But please don't hold it against us. He was the one that asked us to toss him. Long and short, they threw Jonah into the sea. It'll be a delight to have you worship with us at the Well Oasis International every Sunday at 114 Awolawa Road, Ikoyi, Lagos. Our services start at 3 p.m. On Wednesday, our virtual Bible study, where we clearly divide the word of truth, starts at 7 p.m. To join, connect with us on social media at Bidemi MacMordy and at The Well Reveals. For further inquiries, prayers and counseling, please contact 080-905-63555. The Well is an oasis for revival, refreshing and revealing. And I like this Bible. Verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. The same God that sent a wind a great wind has now prepared a great fish and the fish 
swallowed up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In chapter 2, Jonah begins to pray. And he was praying and you could see that he was praying. He was so sure that God would deliver him from the belly of the fish. So he started to pray, oh God have mercy on me. In fact, when I come out, anything you ask me to do, I will do. Is that not what you do? When they lock you up in the belly of the fish, you begin to confess the sins you didn't commit. And you begin to make promises that you have no intention of keeping ultimately. So he confessed and he prayed. And in verse number 10 of chapter 2, the Lord spoke unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Hallelujah. Then the word of God came to Jonah again, chapter 3, the second time. And said unto Jonah, arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. According to the word of the Lord, now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Hallelujah. So Jonah got to Nineveh and God started to preach. He said, I give this city 40 days and what will happen? It shall be overthrown. That was all that Jonah preached. He said, I give this city 30 days, uh, 40 days and it shall be overthrown. In fact, as the Lord liveth, I give this city 40 days and in 40 days it shall be overthrown. The Bible said the men of Nineveh declared a fast. They started to repent. They put on sackcloth. Then the king heard and the king also started to repent. He issued a decree. See, everyone must participate in this repentance. When we fast, we will repent, we will wear sackcloth. The king put on himself ashes. Everybody was repenting. Hallelujah. In verse number 10 of chapter 3, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. Hallelujah. So Jonah was such an effective prophet. Why was he running? We still don't know, right? Chapter 4. But he displeased Jonah. Sure. If God called you and gave you a message and said, go and tell Nigeria. And at the end of the day, the thing was going to come to pass when Nigeria repented. Will you not be grateful? Jonah got angry that the people repented. Never seen a man of God who got angry that the people he preached or changed. But Jonah was angry. And he said to God, Oh Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before thee to Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than live. Sure. Exactly. Kilo de go. What is it that is of annoying? How can you go and preach and see salvation? And they get angry that there was salvation. And then he tells God, he said, I am angry enough that I'm submitting my life. Kill me. Hallelujah. The fox of offense. The fox of offense. You will say, but the Bible did not tell us where Nineveh, a whole people met with Jonah. They never quite met with Jonah as an individual. But Nineveh was one of the biggest cities of Assyria. And at this point in history, the Assyrians were the top dog of the enemies of of Israel. Praise the Lord. And the Assyrians had a signature way of destroying cities. The Assyrians don't come and fight and plunder and go away. When they come, they make sure they make an end of whatever city they go into. Praise Jesus. So if they came into a city, they will first of all deal with everybody. But they will keep the men. Then when they are done, they will either do two things. Either dig graves. They didn't kill the men. They will bury them to their neck and leave them there until they died. Or on the day that the Assyrians are merciful, they will chop off the head of every man. They will collect it and use it to form a pyramid at the gate to the city. It was their signature. It was like a serial killer who would leave 
a signature to say I was the one that did this. With every massacre that the Assyrians carried out, Jonah was angry. But it's very funny how you can be angry with me and I don't even know. Jonah took offense with the people who didn't even reckon with him. Jonah took offense with the people that didn't probably didn't even know his name. Because it wasn't that the Bible, even the Bible calls him the minor prophet, one of the minor prophets. He wasn't that major like Elijah. Do you understand it? But Jonah had taken offense and he probably had been praying for a long time that God will deal with all the Assyrians. Now, their wickedness was real. So Jonah was legitimately offended. <laughs> Let me say that again. I said their atrocities were real. And Jonah was legitimately offended. I mean, he had a right to be offended. He just didn't have the right to play God. Because when the fox, when you allow the fox of offense or the offense talk overwhelm you, what will happen is you will begin to try to play God. You decide who will eat and who will not eat. You decide who we grow and who we don't grow. You decide who can smile and who can't smile. You begin to decide. You sit in your house and you decide that someone can't have something. Why? Because there is offense. And the thing about offense is most of the time we never talk about what it is that has offended us. And that is why offense, I like the fact that the person that we are studying was a prophet. So if anybody needed to know that they shouldn't be in offense, it had to be a prophet. Praise Jesus. For you to know that this fox we are looking at today, you are not free from it. I'm not free from it. I've told you the story before in this place. I want to say it again. And it's an old story. And that's because I don't do those kinds of things anymore, hopefully. That I had this big brother. It's what I call him now. But then I couldn't call him. In fact, the method that he was big brother, I will cringe. Was, but I praise God that he ended up as my big brother. In church those days, fantastic teacher of the word. I keep saying to people that it was his brooding over me that activated this grace on my life. But he had foxes. And I could not stand his foxes. So I took, he didn't do anything to me. Oh. Just that the people of Nineveh didn't do anything to Jonah, but I saw him I, I, I saw him manifest those things and I could not reconcile his position in church and the things that he was manifesting so I took it upon myself to be offended I was so offended that if we came to church and he was the one teaching, I would not hear a word I would sit right in front because I was a minister, I would sit right in front and the guy would be yapping and everybody would be clapping and everybody and I, 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 all I know is his mouth is moving I don't get to hear one word and then if we are at home and in the course of a conversation my husband mentions his name I get upset he's not even there he could determine that is from wherever he'll be he could determine whether I'll be happy or not you just need to mention his name and I get bile will rise up inside of me so I told my husband as I can't stand this person and my husband said hey in the house of God, you can't stand someone. We have to be praying for him. In fact, the method that somebody will ask me to pray for him, I felt like Jonah, Lord, who could take my life rather than pray for this person? Up to tomorrow, didn't steal my money. Did not rape my child. Did not lie against me. Nothing he did to me. If anything, he treated me well directly. But I was offended. So my husband said, what we are going to do is we are going to be praying for this guy. I was like, not on your life. So in the morning, when he wants to pray, he will kneel down. And then we will pray, 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 because we take turns to pray. I will pray for him. We always pray last most of the time. So when he gets to his time, I would have prayed all the prayers. Then Lila, I will pray for that man. <laughs> so when he gets to his turn, 
My husband is the one that will pray for Nigeria. He will pray for the church of Jesus Christ. That's his forte. You know, it looks like on, without meaning to, we defeat the, the focus of our prayers when we pray together. But I noticed that he now started to add this man to it. So he will now pray, 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 pray and say in Jesus' name. And I will not say amen. Because I was offended. So I'll keep quiet. I'm waiting for the next prayer. And then he would repeat. And I will not respond. And the people who don't know Mark think that he's, he's a puppy. He's not. And he too will not move from that prayer point. So he will say in Jesus' name. Oh, mm. <laughs> he's not having... Mm. So by the time I realize that he means business, I will say amen. Then he will get up and we will go. The next day he will do the exact same thing. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And then over time, I noticed that saying amen wasn't that difficult anymore. And over time, I noticed that if he didn't pray, I could actually just say a word of prayer for this person. And over time, one day this guy showed up and said, "Um, I want you to come to Bible college. And I didn't feel like I should take off, separate his head from his body. And that was how I went to Bible college. And I I'm so grateful to God I went in that year because I still think that the grace that is upon my life today that is activated, it was always upon my life, but the activation was based on his incubation of me. Offense. And right now we're sitting beside people we're offended with. Tomorrow we go to the office and the one that kicks me in the gut is we go to bed with our spouses and we're offended at them. Offense. Praise Jesus. And yet in the morning you roll down and you bow down and you are on your knees and you are praying that heaven, which heaven will open? How is, he going to, how is that heaven going to where one pass? The fox of offense. And there are many reasons why we're offended. I'm offended if you are supposed to be a sister and I catch you having a boyfriend. I'm offended on behalf of God. So I begin to hate you and not the sin that you are into. I'm offended if you say something and you never follow through. That's me. On it. It means that your word is not your bond. You don't have integrity. It offends me. The problem is that the one that is caught in a trap is not you, it's me. And I will show you from the Bible. Praise Jesus. So the Assyrians were bad people. Jonah actually had a right to be offended by them. But Jonah had no right to do what? To play God. Since the God of heaven decided that he would give the Assyrians another chance. Or the people of Nineveh another chance at repentance. Another opportunity and repentance. Jonah had no right to say no. Because Jonah at this point started to think that he was the God. But he wasn't the God. He was just the mouthpiece of God. But Jonah said no. Those people know. Fish swallowed him. Vomited him. He went he preached. And as if God wanted to show Jonah, everybody got born again. Jonah got angry. I can tell you that Jonah had never preached in a city where everybody got born again before. He preached this time, everybody got born again. What should he do? If it was me, I would print a card. The preacher of the, the converter of cities incorporated. But Jonah got angry. Then God, did I not tell you? You can't even stick to some. You said you will punish him. You can't even stick to it to the end. I know you are that kind of God. Which was why I didn't want to go on this errand. Offense has the capacity to make you irrational. Thank you for listening. Hope you were blessed. Kindly connect with us on social media at The Well Reveals and at Bidemi McMorty and www.thewellreveals.org. We are The Well, an oasis for revival refreshing and revealing. Modi app. If you open with me,
to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. The fox of offense. I'm offended because your church is bigger than mine. I'm offended because the pastor of that church is a woman. My sister had a house head for three days. And she brought her here. Because it's, it's a long time I left home, so most of them don't know me. The girl came from my village. It's a long time I left home, so most of them don't know me. And so, and even when my father died, when I was there, but the person that you will see that was speaking, blowing all the language was my sister. Because from time, I've, when it comes to being at home, I'm, I've outgrown my popularity in that place. That's what I think. I don't need to make any points. So she walked in here, and she didn't know that I was her older sister. And she sat there with Injideka's house help and said she cannot come to a church where the pastor is a woman, God forbid. She got offended. She had not even said hello to me and she got offended that I was a woman. And I was, said, what kind, what will she teach me? My point is that some of us get offended for something that does not even concern us. If we start this get down and we try to do an interrogation on why a female pastor would be offensive to her, she has no idea. She picked up something somewhere and she's held on to it like gospel truth and she was going to die rather than sit under the teaching of and today I said, don't die in my house. Come and go back to the village. <laughs> Hallelujah. Luke chapter 17. From verse 1 to 5. Then said it, he unto the disciples, it is impossible. But that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a milestone, a millstone were hung about his neck. And he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles turned unto the Lord. The apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. You know, when you read this thing, we always think that it has to do with a miracle, that they wanted their, their faith to be increased because they were trying to perform a miracle. This was the big thing. Jesus had told them the, the process. He said, you can't keep offense in you. And because you can't keep offense in you, if somebody offends you, what should you do? Rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. If they offend you seven times, rebuke them seven times. Vera. If they repent seven times, forgive them seven times. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Offense will come, number one. Be very careful that it doesn't come from you. I don't want to use the expression. Because woe means cursed. But I'm saying here, be very careful that the offense doesn't come from you. Number two. Number three. Be careful. If someone offends you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. If they trespass against you seven times a day. And they turn around and repent seven times a day. Forgive them seven times a day. Offense is scary. It does things to you. It incapacitates you. By the time the apostles heard what Jesus said, they said, we need faith for this one. We can't, we can't do it at this level. We can't do with this. We need extra. Give us more ammunition to be able to deal with this. Amen. So what is it about offense? John Bivet says offense is the bait of Satan. That it is the bait of Satan by which he traps Christians to do his will. 
And he took that straight out of the Bible. If you go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want verse 26. Verse 26. Actually, I want to read from verse 24. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure, we give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. Verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Every time you allow offense to take over your life, automatically you are in the trap of the devil and you work for him. Praise Jesus. So, because if if the devil came in here, if you read your Psalm 133 and you see the power of unity, it says, behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell in unity. Then it begins to describe it's like the oil that was poured on Aaron's head and it flowed all the way to the skirts of his garment. Then it says it's like the dew of Hermon. You know, the dew on the Mount Hermon is anytime you get there, it's rushing like a river. Praise Jesus. There is an abundance in this place. But it goes on to say in that Psalm 133, it says in the, it is in the place of that unity that God has commanded the blessing. Praise God. So once the devil gets in here and he succeeds in making me offended at IJ and IJ is offended at coin and coin is offended at cheat. The devil doesn't even need to walk again. He can go on a vacation all year round. We are enough workers for him now. Offense. By offense, many a family have been broken down. By offense, many a business has been broken down. By offense, many a church has split by offense. In December of 2015, 2014, I remember that I was somewhere in Bagada. It was on a Thursday. And on that day, they were having the APC primaries for the previous administration. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be APC and um, presidential candidates. And it was that one where they were doing the open ballot thing where they had. And you know, the more they were calling our president today, the more, the smaller I was getting on my chair. The more I heard Buhari, the smaller I got on my chair. My, my, my big thing was, no Lord, don't even let him clinch the ticket, let alone begin to run. Now I've never met, I never met Buhari before. When he was um, the um, head, head of state, right? The first time, it didn't concern me. My parents were carrying me. They were paying my bills. Do you get it? The, my parents might have cried, but me, I didn't cry because it didn't, I didn't feel it. So I had nothing against this man. However, I had read unconfirmed reports that he wants to Islamize Nigeria. So that day, as I sat there, I was saying, Lord, don't give us this one. They will burn all the churches in Nigeria. And I heard, and I will never forget, I heard the Lord say to me, shut up. Right? I heard it was like the guy was so upset that he screamed it in my spirit. Keep quiet. Sorry, sir. He said, are you saying that I don't know what I'm doing? No. Huh? I just they beg now. Should be everybody is entitled to pray. Now pray, they pray now. He said, shut up. Since you didn't know to ask me, I am telling you, that's your precedent. Ah. Okay, God, no vex. I don't talk again, but you don't make him our president. I'm not lying. But I heard the Lord clear. I battled from, in fact, after that thing, I got up. I was in Nini's house. I got up and I had to come home. In the car, I could hear the conversation I had with God. And I was like, Lord, do something. Whatever you can do, do it. We will take anything else. I got home. I couldn't say it at first. Then, but during that week, I wouldn't believe how I was monitoring the news. So, of course, he clinched the APC ticket. 
Then I start okay, think if he picks a VP, when he picks a VP, maybe, maybe, maybe. Then the news, if you remember, the news that was going around was that he was going to pick Tinubu. I was like, ah, Jesus, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria. We are finished. Oh, Lord, this one plus this one, my life is over. Lord, he said, I said, keep quiet. Said, I think that what well, that thing that I did was why he told me, he said, every day going forward. I didn't say pray for Nigeria. I said, pray for Muhammad Buhari. I think that in my adult life, in all my life as a Christian, I have never prayed for someone I don't know one-on-one the way I've prayed for our president. And God said, pray for him. Because that thing needs to leave your heart. Because otherwise you can't receive anything on this land. If I keep him here for eight years, you are locked down. So I started to pray. And the more I prayed, the more I started to... I just felt this affection. That's the only word I can, I can use. Towards this man as a person and as a president. I don't know. And if you remember, Audrey, I kept saying, I said, that's our president. That's our president. That's our president. Our job is to pray for him. Our job is to pray for him. Praise Jesus. Then he became president. I remember I did a blog on to the best of my ability. I will never forget that May 29th. I sat in front in, I don't watch TV more. Not even if I watch TV, not those kinds of TV. I was seated in front of the TV when they were doing the swearing in ceremony and I was weeping. I was just crying because God told me and it came to pass and I prayed. You know, there was something. Then a few months, they said we couldn't find our president. I was like, Babo. Then I started to receive WhatsApp messages. And I would receive a WhatsApp message that would say something like, it is God that has punished him, so he's going to die. Offense. People were offended to the extent that they started to wish that he would die. In fact, people were organizing vigils that he would just die in that sickness. And then they will not, because ultimately he picked the VP we have now as his vice president. So, I, I mean, if I didn't receive those, those WhatsApp messages, I received them 10 times. Then what I used to do was, if I receive it from you, I will block you. Because they started to say that he was going to die so that the VP can become president. Offense. We begin to speak to you know, when you hear voices, you know you're supposed to go to Arrow, right? Offense. They were offended. If you sit here till tomorrow and ask them, what did God do? Or what did this man do to you? You know, they don't have something to hold on to. But they are offended by him. Offense. Now, here's the thing that I learned in that transaction. That's why I started from where I started from. For you to know that I didn't start loving the man from anywhere. I'm not our political in any way. I'm not interested. It's not my business. My resource is in heaven. So I tap straight from heaven. Anybody where they hear, you go still favor me somehow. That's the way my mind works. Do you get it? But going through that experience made me recognize that when you don't listen to God and you allow emotions and you allow conjecture, presumption and all the other evil things when they get into you and they pollute your heart offense can come and make room in your house forever otherwise why would Audrey walk into the room today it'll be a delight to have you worship with us at the Well Oasis International every Sunday at 114 Awolawa Road Ikoyi Lagos our services start at 3pm on Wednesday, a virtual Bible study where we clearly divide the word of truth starts at 7 p.m. To join, connect with us on social media at Bidemi MacMordy and at The Well Reveals. For further inquiries, prayers and counseling, please contact 080-905-63555. The Well is an oasis for revival, refreshing and revealing. like a teenager. But imagine she was hurrying to go upstairs. And because in the corner of her eye, it wasn't me. And she doesn't say hello to me. Do you know that, that she didn't say hello to me? And I take offense. It's not about today not saying hello to me. It's about something I had thought about her before. That I just found something to anchor on. 
She couldn't even greet me this time. It has come to her head. Wahala has started. Now, here is the bad thing about offense. The best of us will not say anything wrong about the person. But we won't say anything good about them either. And I found that in the Bible. Absalom, his sister got raped by his brother Amnon. The Bible said Absalom heard it. And he said neither evil not good. He he heard it. And he just pretended like he didn't hear. How did that story end? He killed Amnon. A lot of us. That's when you'll be hearing something like, my mother said, if you die, I don't have something nice to say, I should keep quiet. When you already announce that my mother said, if I don't have something nice today, I should keep quiet. What am I saying? That I have something that is not nice. Offense. And we do it every day. We do it by the names of our churches. We do it by the suits our pastors wear or don't wear. We do it by the cars they ride or they don't ride. We take offense because a man of God has a a, a private jet. We take offense if the man of God takes a tight. We take offense if the man of God's child. Somebody is angry that a pastor's child graduated from university abroad. The person that is angry has four children in university abroad. If you took four of your own, why should I not take one of my own? Offense. So we sit down We take the life and the time and the energy that God gives us. Rather than use it to spread the gospel, we sit on Facebook. And even today I've seen people tweet. And all through today they are tweeting on whether your pastor will take tight or not take tight. And I'm thinking a whole Sunday. Is this the story of your life? Is this all that your life is about? Praise Jesus. And I'm wondering, what is the problem? Everybody wants to hinge their poverty on the pastor. Number one. Everybody wants to hinge their poverty on the government. Number two. Was it the government that asked you not to wake up on time last week? You didn't get to the office, they fired you. What did they have to do with Buhari? And so, okay, last week he was in South Africa. I said, what did he have to do with you not waking up on time? But to cover our faults is the government. Then when we, when we can't reach the government, it's our pastors. Then when we can't reach our pastors, it's our bosses. When we can't reach our bosses, it's our colleagues that are consistently um, um, bootlicking our pastor, our, our bosses. What is wrong with all of you? Why can't you face front? Offense. Offense is how the devil employs you for no pay. And because of that, there is no power in the house anymore. Things are not getting done as they ought to be done. And yet, none of us even takes time to think about it, to say, why am I this angry? Because I promise you, if we sat down today and we said, okay, let's hold a council. And say, okay, you come. You're offended at Sister B. What did she do to you? What did I do to you? She said, I don't smile. I did not smile at her. That's my offense. Jesus. Even on Friday, she still told me that the day you will love me like Tara, the way you love Tara, that day I will go home and sleep. And I like sleep never catch you. <laughs> Offense. By the time the disciples heard how steep the instruction around offense was, they were praying for faith. Because they just realized that they can't do it by themselves. That's why it's a fox. That's why he's a fox. Praise Jesus. What are the symptoms of offense? Number one, anger. When a person's name is mentioned, let's confess. Is there someone here? Okay. Which person is there? Okay. Today, if you call any name, I'm not angry. But yeah, I I, I think I'm not angry today. If you call everybody any name. But you know what I mean, right? There is a name that will just mention something. It's vile. It just rises up inside. Now, how many of you recognize that when you slaughter a goat or whatever, all the animals have bile, right? That you don't, you are very careful that the bile duct doesn't break and spread on the meat. Why? Because if it touches anything, it becomes bitter. Now, when they mention my name and then that thing rises up, do you know what has happened? Your bile duct just broke. <laughs> now, think about it very carefully. You are the one that gets riled up. 
How does that affect me? I'm on my bed watching Netflix. You are angry because somebody mentioned my name. Anger. When someone's name is mentioned. Number two, an inability to pray for them. And me, I'm saying this because I walked it. And I've given you two examples of how I walked it. So I'm not trying to, I'm not even trying to pull anything theoretical for you. Number two, if they say, there are people I'll call now and say, come and pray for this person. And they will begin to stutter. Because they can't bring out words to bless. Because prayer supposes that you are about to bless someone. They can't bring out words to bless those people. If you have that kind of reaction to anyone, you want to make sure you deal with it today. Because if you don't deal with it, hello, you are enslaved to the devil. You may be coming to church 55 times. You work for the devil. That's what it means. And you saw it in the scripture, so I wasn't the one that said it. Go and read 2 Timothy chapter 2 from 24 to 26. Read it in as many versions as you can. The moment you allow someone to have such power over you, the devil can employ you to kill them and it will be easy. The third thing, way, that third symptom of offense is a hidden desire that something should befall them. Even though very faint, it is there. You can't say it because you are a Christian, but it is there. You know it now. It's there. It's, it's veiled. It's faint. But the whiff is there. How do you know? Did there something adverse happens to them? Your first thought is, serves them right. <laughs> now this thing where they commit, I catch up with them. That's, that's your reaction. They are talking like that. Everybody is looking away. That is your reaction. You think deserved you, they deserved it. Good for you. A long way. A hidden desire, or even though it's faint sometimes, that it should come to some kind of harm. This doesn't bubble to the surface until something adverse happens, and you actually feel a smirk. That's that small smile. Like, good for them. In Proverbs 18 verse 19, the Bible says, a brother offended. Let's read it in the King James, then I'll read it in the, um, in the NIV, I think. Proverbs 18 verse 19. I want to read it in the King James version first. Proverbs 18, 19. It says, um, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. In the NIV, I believe, it says, a brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like bad gates. Their disputes are like bad gates of a citadel. When a man or a woman is walking in offense, he builds a wall. Praise Jesus. And that wall is built to protect him. Because once you've been offended once, the tendency is I don't want to be offended again. And if you don't want me to offend you again, you have to protect yourself, right? So you build a wall, or I build a wall to protect myself from your offense. Now, the same wall that is protecting me from your offense is keeping every other favor out. So you build that wall and you are now inside there. Now, the question I want us to try and answer is what makes an offense? What makes an offense? I think an offense is one because they come from our disappointments in the people we have expectations from and sometimes from our loved ones. Praise Jesus. I think mostly from the people that we love. See, if I was driving home today, let's say I'm in Oshodi and one other motorist winds down and does what they do. Calls me something. Do you understand it? In that moment, I will be upset, right? But do I wake up this night and not sleep because of him? No, because by the time I get home, I've even forgotten him. Why? Because he's not in proximity to me. I have no expectations from him. I may never meet him again for the rest of my life. Even if I met him, I wouldn't recognize him. 
But let my husband wind down his window and say that thing that that person said to me. How many of you know that the next three months, there is a war going on in my house? Just when the guy thinks that it's over, I will start again. Why? Because I am what? I am offended. Why am I offended that Mark said something that another man said to me and did not mean anything to me? Why am I so offended that Mark said it to me? Because I have expectations from Mark. And so when he does that to me, I'm disappointed at him. The other group of people that, you know, we, we get into offense with, if we use this president's um, example that I gave, people that we have respect or regard for, if you go to the bottom of the stories that are circulating, it was people in that my father's era who fed the brunt of something. So, and you know, the moment is, um, what's it, oral, oral tradition. The moment we, it's two stories that are handed down from one generation to another generation to another generation. They get worse as they are handed down. If you call all those people on Twitter and sit them down and say, do me an essay, what did this man do? That's where you know that they can't find out. They don't know where the story started from. They just heard and then they latched on what they heard. Praise Jesus. But all of that is anchored on the fact that someone disappointed me that I had regards for. Someone disappointed me that I had expectations from. Praise Jesus. Now, you say, how do I deal with that? Because we are bound to continue to live life in expectations. We are bound to live life in relationships with other people. To recognize that no matter what, the final authority is not man but God. To recognize that man would always fail. His flesh, he is not configured never to fail. So even when I'm dealing with a man, honestly, in the end, I'm dealing with God. I will walk with man, but I will trust God. Now you say, how does that put food on my table? Would you rather be a slave to the devil? I don't think so. Praise Jesus. So offenses comes from people we have regard for or people we are in a relationship with. Now, what happens with offense is when the error of uh, the, the, the fox of offense goes unchecked, it builds into a feeling of betrayal. That's why after four days of not talking to Mark because of what he said, that somebody has said to me, no, Shodi, and I did not bat an eyelid. When eventually he gets me to sit down to have that conversation, I begin with, I could not even recognize that you were the one that said it to me. It begins with, I can't believe that you will open your mouth and say that kind of thing to me. And then he's not looking like, what thing did I say? Do you understand it? Because in the four days that I was processing it, it has landed in Mark betrayed me. Why didn't I come down from my car and hold that man in Oshodi and say, you betrayed me? Do you see it? It's the same exact thing they said. Why is it more painful in one person than the other person? Why can't I let it go for this one the way I let it go for that one? Because it's only those who are close to us that can betray us or get us to that place where we begin to feel like they have betrayed us. Praise Jesus. Now, when betrayal goes unchecked, it becomes hatred. Because if you ask the people who are divorced today how the journey started, it was from somebody hit you once or from somebody cheated on me once apologized and then cheated again apologized and then the next time didn't only cheat they not now bring money apologized and then after a while they no longer make sense and with each of those things happening you are moving you are moving you are moving after a while one day you wake up and you take a look at the person that you were doing some assaults concerning when you were married and the only thing that can drop out of your mouth is I hate you Thank you for listening. Hope you were blessed. Kindly connect with us on social media at The Well Reveals and at Bidemi McMordy and www.thewellreveals.org. We are The Well, an oasis for revival, refreshing, and revealing.